He's the reigning world champion. Will you welcome the brilliant rocket himself, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Good evening from Teddington Studios and welcome to the 1990 Thames Snooker Classic. That was one of my dreams, was to, uh, was to qualify for that. Ronnie O'Sullivan to break. Great shot there from Ronnie O'Sullivan. Yeah, that was when I was a good player. I was 14. And I remember Steve Davis commentating. Advanced positional play. And Davis said, um, that's an advanced positional play. <laughs> and it was, because it was like, I knew that red was there, but I just knew that once I get the reds open, it was game over. Steve Davis was saying, now this kid is fantastic. <laughs> Anyone who's held a cue before knew he was a genius. I was ready at 13 or 14 to play top professional snooker in hindsight. I didn't know it at the time, because I just never had that belief in myself. But I was getting the results. I was beating Willie Fawn on his own table at 14. But at the time, I never thought anything of it. But I was ready, you know. I was, I was playing a man's game at 13, or a professional game at 13. Ronnie was always fearless. You know, and, and that was something which hadn't come into the professional game. At the time, the top pros were percentage players, where they would calculate the risk-reward ratio of every shot. Uh, Ronnie never went, never played percentages. Well, here comes Dad, Ronnie Senior. <laughs> his, his dad's a good snooker player, he's a good hurdler. Mm -hmm. That was a tremendous performance. Ronnie Junior, first of all. Are you really only 14? Yeah. Just six weeks ago. I'm 14. <laughs> yeah, he's my biggest fan. He's my biggest fan. I get embarrassed sometimes when he start talking about him. I'm like, oh, close my ears, like, shut my eyes, like, like, saying, be quiet. But he's proud, you know? He's proud of me, you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah, he's... But I don't like it when he praises me. I hate praise, anyway. Dad, stop running away. Come here, I know you're a bit shy. <laughs> Tell me, when did you realise he might be a good snooker player? When he was beating me. <laughs> You're pretty useful yourself, are you? Useless. <laughs> no, I was playing for a few quid. He was taking a few quid off me, and I turned it in there. If I was left to my own devices, I'd be on a beach in Spain, putting dick chairs up, having a coffee, reading the paper, and just plodding along in life. I'm a plodder, really. You play fairly quickly. Well, when you're playing well, you do play quick. You think quicker, and all the ball seems easier. No nerves about being on television? No. As long as Dad isn't sitting in the front row, that's right. Yeah. Isn't it? You don't like that. <laughs> So Dad knows his place, and uh, yeah. you certainly seem to know yours, Ronnie. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was my first debut on telly. It was all downhill after that. <laughs> was. At the age you were, what was the hardest part of your dad not being around? The first minute I found out he was got what he got, uh, that was the hardest moment, definitely. And a few days after that, because it was all settled in, the enormity of it all, you know? I didn't realise. I just thought he was going to come home. I just thought, go through the thing, did as everyone was saying, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was just an accident, really. <laughs> you know, for two people in the wrong place at the wrong time you know so for me I didn't expect it so to, to hear it at the age I was was uh it killed me killed me man done me you know I just didn't know what to do I was like oh, done me so uh, that was the hardest bit and then having to realize what people were there telling me was like, you know what, he ain't coming home for 20 years. I went, what do you mean? I went, minimum 20. I was like, oh, I couldn't get me around it. I thought, well, that's it, he's gone. Forget about him. That's it. And then I come down the house the next morning, I got out of bed and it was quiet. The house was quiet. Because he ain't quiet. He kind of like chats and he's a people person. It's difficult to get inside a young man's head, you know, when you haven't got a father figure that was so important in your life is no longer there. 
I was demotivated, if you like. It was no one was there to tell me what to do, and I needed it. But you still feel, in a way, that it's still you and him against the world. It's like a crusade. You know, no one believed in Ronnie more than Ronnie Senior, and no one was closer to Ronnie Senior than Ronnie Junior. Then I become eight, seventeen, eighteen. I thought I'm a man now. I need to kind of like sort myself out. You know, so, you know, it's now become a job. It's like okay, you know. A job, plus I need to fulfil my potential. Yeah, a proud moment. Definitely a proud moment because obviously, you know, I knew how much it meant to him. You know, 12 months before, I lost to Cliff Wilson before the television stage and I, I remember going back to my hotel room, crying my eyes out. I smashed my cue case on the floor. My cue came flying out, my cue case. I was walking, I was devastated. I was devastated. This young man is not 18 yet. And like all great players, he's finishing in style. And so then so for 12 months later to go and win the UK, I was like, mental. Yeah, Stephen Hendry will shake his hand. I know he admires Ronnie's play. We all do. The title of the 1993 United Kingdom champion, Ronnie O'Sullivan. UK champion, 17 years of age. Like, wow. I beat my hero, Steve Davis. I beat Stephen Hendry, my new hero. I just thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. We snooker players in the inside, we knew how good he was. So, although. Maybe it was one year too early he won it. It wasn't a surprise because we know how good he was. So I beat all these people in one event and all of a sudden overnight I've gone from no one knowing me to all of a sudden the UK champion. And I still didn't realise the impact it had till the next day when I went out and had breakfast because I've gone from no one ever recognising me to all of a sudden people were like, oh, and I was like, shit, people were pointing at me. <laughs> he pocketed a cheque for £70,000, but I have to say, he says he'd give it all up to spend Christmas with his dad. He's with us now. Hi, Ronnie. Hello. Hi, Hi. Nice Hi. First of all, many congratulations. You don't look 70, doesn't you? Look I was just saying, you look like about 23, 24. That's what uh, living in a snooker all does uh, for you. Misspent youth. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't <laughs> drink, do you? you? I don't drink and I, and I don't smoke and I don't really uh, go out to, to clubbing it much because. I've uh, dedicated much of my time to me snooker now. 17-year-old Ronnie O'Sullivan is tipped to become the world's youngest number one. If he does, he says he owes it all to his dad, who he visited today in prison. Ronnie Sr. is serving a life sentence at Gartree Prison in Leicestershire. It was a tearful reunion when Ronnie Jr. took his new trophy to the prison to show it off to his dad. I went to see my dad and took the trophy in there and that was like... TV crow down there, I was like, what's going on here? No, but I just wanted him to go, yeah, mate, that's for you. You know, that's for you. And uh, so he could just go, you know what? You know, that put a lot of things to rest. You know, that answered a lot of... For me, it kind of dealt with a lot. It was like, you can get on with whatever you've got to do now for the next 18 years, Dad, you know what I mean? You've, I've given you a bit of silverware. I've proved that you ain't to blame for my whatever. I've, you know, that's it. We can move on now, you can move on, I can move on and enjoy whatever we do. Especially with all me, my mum being there, my sister, sort of like, they sort of like, couldn't believe it, everyone coming out for autographs and you can see me dad sort of like, he feels at home and, and he's just sort of like really proud of me and I'm, and I'm more to the point proud of him because of he's, well, he's made me, I haven't really made myself, I've got a lot to owe to him and, and the way I am is the way he is. He will, even if I want to talk history, he used to say, I go, what? He went, history. It's over. Forget it. Move on. Next one. I'd be like, really? OK. He's just told me it's history now. All the press is nice and that. He said, but Thursday morning, get ben, back down to the practice and that. He says, because one victory is not enough. His dad's probably watching this morning. Anything you want to say to him? Yeah, I just want to say what a good visit it was yesterday, innit? And it was definitely better than winning the tournament, seeing his face and reactions. And we had two and a half hours of laughing and joking. And, mm. and at the end of it, he just patted me on the back and says, Go and, go and get another trophy. I remember looking at it thinking, they look good for a 147. Amazing, absolutely amazing. I don't think I suffered with depression. I think I suffered with snooker depression. I had a five year period where I just went mental.
This is a, a picture Damien Hurst done for me, my friend. And uh, it's my first 147. Um, five minutes, 20 seconds. And I remember when I first see it, I went, that's my first 147, without Damien even saying anything. So I remember this red. What? And I remember that black going over there. I just remember thinking, I remember looking at it thinking, them, they look good for a 147. We had a 147 in five and a half minutes. Don't think that'll ever be done again. Impossible, I think. One more rad in the frame safe, but Ronnie's got other things in his mind, and so has everybody in the audience. Could be a 147. I don't believe this. That, that can never be beaten. He was absolutely playing speed-wise, twice above himself. And then I spoke to Ronnie, I said, why did you do that, Ronnie? He said, because if I stopped and think, I would have missed. I remember watching it, thinking, there's a lot of Q over hanging. And I just went, like that. <laughs> just a bit of magic in sport, that was. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Like two hole-in-ones on a trot, something like that. When he made that, he kind of, uh, made his name through that and then ever since then people have just loved watching him and um, you really don't know what's going through his head so people just um, tune in to just see what he's going to do. Alex Higgins is 14, was 14 years older than me. I'm 14 years older than Ronnie O'Sullivan and now you've got Judge Trump who's 14 years younger than Ronnie so maybe there's always going to be an entertaining player out there. I'd say everyone uh, sort of my age used to who's got into Suko has probably modelled their game on him. Um, when I first started playing, I used to play really quick, um, just to play like him. Did you always play fast? Uh, yeah, I was always a quick thinker. Um, I had good technique, but I, f I used to think quick, so I'd see the shot early. Um, so I was quite a consistent player, but I was quick, which was kind of not heard of really because you was either methodical and slow or you was quick but a bit flamboyant with your technique. I first met him when I was eight. Uh, my dad got me tickets to the Welsh Open and um, Ronnie was there so um, luckily I got to meet him and have my photo with him in that um, which was 15 years ago now. I've managed Ronnie O'Sullivan twice. Some of the greatest days of my life have been with Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ronnie O'Sullivan has also driven me round the bend, driven me nuts. And there are times when I could hug him, and there are times when I could kick him. I prefer the hugging. Oh, this memory is uh, going to school, messing around, playing a bit of football, painting little toy cars, stuff like that. A lot of the time I spent in Hackney with my nan, because my mum and dad both worked, so a lot of my summer holidays were in Hackney, riding around in my BMX just having fun with the kids out there. Uh, my mum and dad basically worked round the clock and a lot of the time I just used to live with another family who lived round the corner. Uh, and then there was old pairs that were brought in who used to look after me most of the time until my sister was born when I, I think I was about eight or nine then. And then my mum stopped working and, and that was it. You know, I was at home all the time with my mum. That's why I bought this house, because it was near my mum. So I thought I'd get all my washing done. And just two she's minutes. Just down the road, she? Yeah, she lives 20 doors away. What were school days like? I hated school. Oh, I couldn't stand it. You know, she's a. Oh, if I could never have gone this, from the age of 10, if, if I didn't go do another day of school, I'd have been a happy, happy kid. But obviously, my mum, um, she was like the one that always used to say, Well, what happens if he doesn't make it as a snooker player? You know, he's got to have something to fall back on. I had a five-year period from the age of 19 to 24 where I just went mental. My dad was banged up, my mum was away, I was up that prison, then visit my mum here and I'd lost my licence and I just thought, you know what? I just lost the plot and I just went out and had a good time for four or five years and just... What do you feel about that? I'm just gutted, you know? 
I knew in the back of my mind that my dad was there going, you know what, up in the morning, run, do your three mile run, get showered down the club, 10 in the morning, back home for five, have your dinner, in bed by nine, early nights, up in the morning, bump, fine pin, healthy body, healthy mind. I had that voice in my head. So when I was out having late nights and I was out doing whatever I was doing, I had that in the back of my head. But they wasn't here. So they, in a way, I was like, well, no one's here to tell me what to do. It's as if I needed someone to put me in my place. And I still kind of need that sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't have the confidence uh, of his, in his game or in himself to deliver. Uh, you know, sometimes he needs an arm around him and, and sometimes he probably needs a clip around the ear. Foul. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Because I'd been unhappy for quite a bit of my life, you know. You know, snooker, I kind of got a bit obsessed with it and couldn't, couldn't get the perfectionism that I wanted. I'd come home and I'd be so frustrated and I'd be like, you know, I'd be a nightmare to be around, so I'd be on my own a lot of the time because I didn't want to socialise with people. So I'd become so driven to kind of succeed that, um, that I, in the end I just hit dumb head in. I suppose, that I couldn't attain this perfection. You know, I knew what success was like. I knew I was capable of it, but I wasn't achieving it, and I was, like, frustrated. And I was seeing other people getting results that I thought, you know what, I should be blowing them away. <laughs> his biggest strength is, is what God gave him. He's a natural player. He's born to play. His biggest weakness is Ronnie O'Sullivan himself. Well, this is a bad mess. I don't think I suffered with depression. I think I suffered with snooker depression. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I don't think I'm a depressed type of person. I just think I suffer with a depression to do with snooker. Um, and it's and I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. You know, I just I could go out and play, but take me out of there. I couldn't do life. I couldn't do people. I didn't want to socialise. I had a social phobia. Which, you know, so I had to kind of... It was a nightmare. My life be felt like a bit of a nightmare. I, I found running. I was, you know, by mistake, I'd been out on a bender, I'd come, I went down to the gym, I thought I'd got to get myself sorted. The geezer here said, I'm going to run, you want to come? And I went, oh, I'll go with you. And he took me on a run, he killed me. And then it was outdoors, it was fresh air, it was the complete opposite, and it gave me like, an endorphin rush that I'd never had before, you know? And it helped me manage my snooker better. It helped me deal with the, the stress and the pressure and the frustrations that I... That I found myself with the game that I loved. I kind of have this thing of like, I love being outdoors, I love the fresh air, I love being over the woods in the forest, and it kind of gets me away. And I feel, you know, I want my ashes over the forest. When I'm dead, I want to be ashed up and thrown over the forest, mate, because that's where I've, that's where I've battled a lot of my demons. That's where I've come up with a lot of answers. That's where I've come up with you know, resolving things and it's, it's made things wrong right. So, you know, I owe a lot to that because it kind of got me where I am today and uh, it's got me through my career, if you like, because that's all I've done, I've got through it. All right, I've been successful, all right, I've won tournaments, all right, I've done this. I've ticked the boxes. I've won the world titles, I've won that, I've won that. I've won it four times, four times, four times. So I've ticked the boxes, I've become not just a world champion, become a multiple, you know. But I could have easily jacked it in after the first one. So for me, getting outdoors and being laid back is kind of me saying, you know what, that's, that's, that's where I'm happiest, if you like. <laughs> Here's a player that has fallen in and out of love with the game, with the authority. Sometimes he thinks he's got the world on his shoulders. And yet, he can be the nicest person that you'll ever meet. He's an enigma, and geniuses are enigmas. I just believe that the most important thing, the biggest love of my life is my snooker. I've never, never been so emotionally ingrained in something, a person, an object, anything, like I have been with snooker. <laughs> They're my people. This is what I play for. He just tried to do his brain in as much as I couldn't, and I got him. I felt so brittle. I was down with doctors, mate. It was going insane. Under 
Natasha. Two thousand. I come out of rehab. That was a big season for me. Will you welcome Rudy O'Sullivan and Mark J. Williams? Well, I thought, you know what? I need to sort this out. I was at a make or break point. I just come out of rehab. So I was like, just having to live with just natural feelings. I wasn't picking up no drink. I couldn't kind of like that was it over for me. And I thought, I'm, I'm just going straight. And. Um, so now I was like, I've got time, you know, I had lots of, you know, it was like the, my world changed. I was like, oh, I'm getting up early in the morning. I'm I'm clean, I'm washing every day. Whereas before I'd get out of bed, put my gear on. I wouldn't even have a wash, mate. I'd just get in the car, go down, egg, chips and beans, thank you very much, boom, on the table. And I was just, you know, that was it. The week's major attraction, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Now I'm getting up, I'm going for my run, I'm fit, I'm, I'm, I feel like my eyes are... I'm seeing things, it's like, wow, I've got this new intensity about myself. At 4-1 to Mark Williams, the world champion looked as though he was on course for the £100,000 first prize. Now it's wide open, four frames each. So I kind of um, started, you know, working on my technique, working with a coach. I'd go to Bristol once a month, and some days I'd be up there and I'd be like, oh, I'll be so tired. Well, I've been at the table for six, seven hours just working on stuff. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 77, under three. This fast-flowing, fluctuating final ebbs once more in favour of the fans' favourite. Ronnie O'Sullivan is 6-5 up on the verge of being the Champions Cup winner. I knew my game needed to change for me to be able to win the world title because I was too inconsistent. The bad habits that had crept in wasn't going to allow me to sustain it for 17 days. So I knew I needed to work on my consistency and know that I could get up and have a, a formula that I could take to the practice table and if something weren't right I could change a couple of things and I was away again. Ronnie O'Connor, 91. £100,000 and the Champions Cup. Fresh outlook, new perspective, an improved person, an improved player, and no more popular winner than Rocket Ronnie O'Sullivan. And there ain't much time for fun and games. There ain't much time for people putting yourself in situations where people want an autograph or they want a photograph or they're, like, or they're you know what I mean? You just have to kind of make sure that you're in a safe place sometimes where you can just recharge to go and do what you need to do because that is what it's about. How do you feel yourself, Sam? Um, I was emotional because I've, I've obviously been through a lot of stuff in the last few months and uh, I was that close to quitting the game and I've been saying it for a long time and I've just had to get my life in order and thankfully I've managed to do that and life to me is, is, is much more than important than this green bays and a bit of wood because that's brought my life for the last six, seven years because I've always wanted to give the public what I know I'm capable of and I haven't been able to do it. And, uh... Even though I talked about letting go of it, I couldn't walk away from it. I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in me. I hadn't achieved what I knew I should have achieved. So it was like I had to keep going. I'm just going to enjoy my life and, and I'm going to be playing snooker for a long, long time and I am really appreciate all these people here because they're, they're my people. This is what I play for. And I've got some people here today, they know who they are, but they mean a lot to me as well. Um, I'm not going to, but they're just different class and uh, I've got some good people around me now and I've been, I'm just looking forward to, to just life again. Start, starting on over again at 24, it's mad really. A great champion, Ronnie O'Sullivan, ladies and gentlemen. Even during those big victories, how much were you battling with it. Yeah, I mean, I remember doing a radio interview in 2001. I mean, I was going into that World Championships as clear favourite. Out of 12 events, I'd won six. Everyone around was saying, well, he's guaranteed he's going to win it. Um, but I was suffering. No one knew that a week before that World Championship, I was down with doctors, mate. Couldn't even... Social phobia, I couldn't be around people. 
And the girl I was with at the time, she was really concerned, you know, she was like, wow, this is not, you know, you really ain't well. <laughs> and I went to Sheffield and I was in my room and they said, can you do a radio interview? And I felt so brittle. I couldn't, I, I, I went, I said, yes. But I thought, how am I going to get through this and not let them know that I'm suffering? We just we'll, we'll, we'll go with it and see. so I was blabbering on, blabbering on. I was like spurting these words out. I was like, ugh, ugh. I thought, what am I saying? And I just went to her. I said, you know what? And it was live. I said, you know what? I said, I really ain't feeling too good. <laughs> I said, I'm suffering here. I said, talking to you. I said, I don't want to be here. I said, I'm. I said, I'm struggling. Oh. <laughs> but I thought I can't hide this. I can't hide anymore. The more I tried to hide, the more I tried to not let people know I was feeling, the more I was feeling like... I felt, oh, I felt like I was just... I was going insane. And they went, oh, we just hope you get better. We'll call, you, we'll call the interview off. Just, we wish you the best of luck, whatever you do. do, 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 do you know what I mean? I was like, OK. Put the phone down. And I phoned the Samaritans up. Someone said, phone the Samaritans up. So I was like, man, I was like, chat to this woman. She, you ain't going to kill yourself. And I went, well, f I don't feel too good. I said, but I don't think I'm going to kill me. I said, oh, you know, I said, because oh. I knew that if I'd stopped the snooker, a lot of my demons would have gone. But like I said to you before, I couldn't walk away because I still had to do what... I had my dad in there. And every time he said, I see you on the telly, he said, it's like a visit for me. And I was like, oh, I've got to play. Because that that's all he looked for. He said, the only things I look forward to are visits with you. And should you come and see me once a month? And I'd be like, OK, so that was a kind of pressure in itself. But I loved seeing him. And I wanted to see him. And then when he said to me about watching me on the telly, he said, I love it, you know, put the kettle on, see you. He said, like a visit. He said, I sit there, no one comes in. He said, because I don't like anyone rooting for the other player. <laughs> he said, so, I, so I, I heard this and I was like, he's got another 10 years to go, so I've got to at least play for another 10 years. But I didn't feel like it. I felt like I just wanted to walk away, but there was that pressure there of trying to do the right thing for somebody else. Ronnie's had every coach there is in the game, I think. You know, he's tried all different coaches, you know, just to get inside their heads and, uh, you know, probably most of them tell him stuff he already knows, but he's been, you know, right the way through the card, you know, he's picked everybody's brains and, um, is 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 at peace when he's um, you know when he's confident and he's at peace. Is, there's no one uh, can beat him. I knew I needed to kind of find some sort of game that could survive and get me through. And I worked with a coach for a year, and bang, we won the world title. There's the black. He's an eight. The balls are perfectly placed. Could this be his first world title? No mistake, and it was effectively match ball that time. John Higgins was in first in this play with 45. But Ronnie O'Sullivan wins the Embassy World Championship. Massive relief, and that was it. It was like, <laughs> massive monkey off my back. And like, the pressure had just gone <laughs> out there. Yeah. This has been the fulfilment of an outstanding talent. It's a fantastic feeling for me, obviously, winning um, the MC World Championships was, was a great, great feeling for me and everyone around me, you know, we've worked so hard for that. But obviously I want to put that to the back of my mind now. I started to win a few tournaments, I started to pick a few trophies up. I started to feel good about it and I was like, God, why didn't I do this from day one? Because I was meant to be the youngest world champion at the age of 11, 12. <laughs> I just got off on being in a snooker environment and, you know, I was just around adults all the time. So it was good banter. The lads were always t t taking the mick out of each other. There's always people playing pranks, you know. It's like, a, it's like its own little soap opera at the club, you know. There's all little... He was going out with a... It was just all a bit of a 
yeah, it was a good buzz, you know. If I wasn't there, I, was, I, I felt like I was missing out on something. My uncle got a table for his son, yeah. and I went over his ass. And I started playing that, and I thought it was good. I couldn't knit a ball to save my life, but... And then my dad got me a table at Christmas, and I weren't allowed to play on it until Christmas. And we had it in for two weeks, and he kept saying, no, no, you're not playing on it. <laughs> and I used to cry, and he used to play all his mates. My dad kind of invested a lot of time and money, if you like, into supporting me, making sure that I could get to tournaments, making sure that I could get taxis to the snooker club, make sure my table bill was always paid, my food bill was always paid. All he asked was for me to not mess around and, and when I was there to, to put the effort in and, and not play the fruit machines, because I went for a spell of playing fruit machines. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was like, £200 jackpot. I was only like nine. I've got to have some of that. My dad, my dad used to come in and think, God, that's a big bill, 70 quid. He used to wonder what I was spending my money on. He said, and then one day he come in and my dad put a couple of quid in the fruit machine. He said, and I just see this little head pop up. He said, and you were looking under the reels. He said, and then I realised where all the money was going. What kind of things would you get up to in the club then? You wasn't allowed to bring your own food into the club, and, and I, but I just wasn't going to eat their burger and chips and their fried food. I was on a health kick, so I'd bring in my own food, my own sandwiches. And she'd go, you're not allowed to bring your food. And I'd go, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, but you got a spoon for me yoghurt and that. And she'd be fuming. You could see there was smoke coming out of her ear holes. But, you know, it was just little things, you know. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of banter with the other lads, you know. Um, you just, it was just good fun. How do you feel when you watch Snooker on the television you see the Steve Davises and everybody else? Is that where you're headed? Yeah. Yeah. How big do you want to be? 5'10". Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He obviously meant how big did I want to be in the sport, but I said I want to be about 5'10". <laughs> and I just remember everyone laughing. I thought, what are they laughing at? <laughs> But then, like, obviously, when I watched it back, I was like, oh, OK. I know why they're laughing now. But that's all I wanted to be, was five foot ten. I thought that was the perfect height for a snooker player. No good being four foot nine. I never made it. In a way, I bullied people on the table without really knowing it. Um, but I just, I just knew that if there was a red on, I was going to clear up. Really set my mind to it. Really concentrated, and I really slowed my game down because he's a very fast player and just tried to do his brain in as much as I couldn't and I didn't and he started missing balls and I got him and then I won the game 3-1. The obvious question is, what do you make of Ronnie O'Sullivan? Only 14 six weeks ago. That's right, a great player and um, I've played him in a couple of exhibition matches and um, proved today that he can do it in front of the cameras and uh, I don't really think that even Stephen Hendry was was putting the no sort of breaks on the television at 14. I kind of learnt off of Steve Davis, if you like, when I was a youngster. That was who I wanted. He was my role model. So I used to copy everything he used to do. I used to watch all his videos, all his games. I'd watch how he'd walk around the table, his cue action, everything. I mean, I, I copied him to his waistcoat, his shoes, everything. You know, there wasn't anything I missed out, you know, because he was my role model. So would you watch Steve on TV and sort of make mental notes about what to, how to dress and how to play? Well, a lot of it was visualisation, really. You kind of visualised how he got down to the shot, where his body was, where he was on the table, where his arm was, how his arm was bent, where his head was situated, where his shoulders were. I'd studied the whole lot, how his leg was bent, this one, this one was straight, um, you know, the levels of his hips. I studied him like you wouldn't believe. Bang on that left eye, I like it. I suppose it was obsessive if you look at it now, because it's. But I think you need to be. For me to have got to that level, if I wouldn't have been thinking like that, then I could have just been, you know, an average player. But I didn't want to be. I didn't realise I was what I wanted to be. I just knew that if I was going to do it, that he was the man to follow, and and I had to follow every little detail to the to the last, and and every little detail mattered. He loves his kids. I remember him looking around and going, wow, what is that? I wanted to win more world titles and got the flavour now. Success was lovely. Don't ever doubt me. Don't ever tell me that I'm gone. I will let you know when I'm gone.
meant to be the personal champion and he made up and privileged to be the first great player. Hope. Ronnie's just a genius really, easily the best player that's ever played. Um, he sort of plays like, sort of like he don't want to be there but you know that he's trying his life out out there. He gives off this aura when you play him. Um, he puts you under more pressure than anyone else, so it's always tough playing him. I'm a good friend of his. He's a smashing kid. Um, well, he's a man now, but uh, he's always been a smashing kid and got a heart of gold. And uh, I just hope he can get up when he plays snooker and enjoy it, because everybody enjoys watching him. What, me, Jimmy and Ronnie? We're in an unbelievable situation to watch Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards playing the guitars. It was a nice hot day, I remember it. So we was having a few drinks. We was sort of having a few drinks with him, and then they sort of told us, you know, you have a game of snooker. And then Ronnie said, come, we've got to play snooker. So I was like, all right, so we went and played. And we'd been up all night, and... Um, if I remember it, right, it was like, out of 11 frames, it was 10 centuries. So that was an amazing bit of snooker. He beat me 6-5, I remember it. I do remember it, I've got quite a good memory. I bet that was a great night as well, wasn't it? Can't remember it. He can. And I remember counting to Keith. I was, I was just drinking vodka and orange. So I was like a little bit, that's probably why I was putting all the balls. And uh, he kept going to get me my drink. And then halfway through it, he went to like Mozart. And I remember watching Mozart when I was at school and he was like this genius pianist. So to, for Keith to say that, I was like, oh, he must be impressed by this, you know? Oh. Certainly thrilling this crowd is Ronnie O'Sullivan. Obviously a name for the future, and I'm sure you're very excited at home as well as we are here. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 22, frame on the match. Quite simply, magnificent. He takes the Embassy World Championship as the crucible audience give him a standing ovation. I wanted to get better. I wanted to win more world titles, win more UKs. I've got the flavour now. Success was what it, it was lovely. Ronnie O'Sullivan becomes the 2008 world champion. I felt good. I felt happy, you know, and I was like, okay. So I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And then I had spells where my game would fall off. But, you know, I had something, to, I had someone to work with and things in place to make me help me keep on track. How Ronnie's cope with it and how his dad's cope with it has been remarkable, really, that they've come through this really long, difficult, what, 18 years or so period. And now, of course, they're back and bonded again and, and they're best mates as well as being father and son. Sum up your dad then, what kind of guy is he? How would you describe him? Uh, heart of gold, loyal, um, and, uh, and hungry. <laughs> I'm not hungry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more laid back. I'm a bit more, oh yeah, we'll see what happens, go with the flow. On the snooker table, I'm angry, you know, I'm ferocious. But away from it, I just can't be bothered. I just let things go. I go, oh, don't worry about it. You know, if someone's done something wrong to me, I go, that's all right, I don't care, you know what I mean? I sometimes feel like I'm too laid back to let too, too many things go. And, and really, I should have a bit more of a, you know, go get type of attitude, you know? Because I admire that in people. All my friends have got that. They get up and go, and they did, 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 like, and I just, and I just buzz off of them. But I can't be bothered. I'd rather go running, have a boiled egg in the morning, read me paper, and just chill out. Go to walk over the forest, get me mountain bike out, put the two kids in the back, fresh air, cup of tea and a muffin, weigh them in, get them tired, bring them home, put them in bed. I'm done. realise until the first one kind of like changes your whole you know there's a reason to go to work now as before I was like you could just go along with the flow if you like but then when someone else comes into the world you're like hold on I'm, I'm now responsible for this little thing here that don't know how to eat you just poos in a nappy and when you go out the door you go to work you go right I've got to go and do it for them now this young lad is making the game look incredibly simple at the moment 
there's some shots I can't play, which I used to be able to play when I was 12, 13, 14, which separated me from the rest. Now and again, they come into my game and it falls into place and then I'm, I'm away and I can't be caught. You know, they can't stay with me. Like this year's World Championships, I spelled, I went bam, 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 bang, and there was nothing that anybody could have done. Final frame of World Championships. The crowd are going wild. I could put that ball anywhere on the table. I could take. I could. I could dominate. I could attack. I could out safety him. I could out put him. There was nowhere that they could go with me for certain times in that World Championships. The crowd now realise that it's all over. The win this year was a statement of what Ronnie O'Sullivan can bring to the game of snooker, and it's that entertainment. It's that wow factor. The X factor. It's going to be emotional here. The Crucible Theatre. What a performance from Ronnie O'Sullivan. Three times a world champion. It's now four. Your champion, Ronnie O'Sullivan. For little Ronnie to come to the World Championships, that was the best buzz. And to have him there for the final day, for me, was just like the best thing, at, you know, great feeling. And I never get emotional. I always hold back my emotions. I never break down. I try not to anyway. My dad said to me, don't ever cry. If you win, I was like, all right. It's a little runner, yeah. That's even better, that, because look, he's buzzing with the, uh, look, he's looking at all the little things that come up on the, you know, when they go bang and all them little things. I didn't realise, because obviously, but he was more buzzing with all that. I remember him looking around and going, wow, what is that? That there, he's just, he's just posing, isn't he? Best moment ever for me, that. It just felt like me and him were in that venue at that time. There was a thousand people in there, because it's only a small venue. But just, it just felt like it was just me and him there. I was going through, putting him last balls, and I just I was like, come on, hold it down. I hold it down, but it was just like a mental feeling. Mental feeling, because you know, I've been through a lot the last few years. And my bond with him is so strong in a way that it kind of like, it really, it was only me and him there. And he said to me the other day, he says, we won the world title, didn't we? And I was like, yeah, we did. He loves his kids and it was a wonderful situation for him to get his fourth title. You know, him and Higgins are the two best players in the world. And uh, he's levelled him on the world title, so, you know, and he's back playing. You can't gamble on this Ronnie O'Sullivan and know what the Ronnie O'Sullivan in three months is going to be like. Because his life has always been controversial and always been surprising and never ever predictable. For me that's like the final chapter. Yeah. There ain't no more chapters to be written anymore. Done it all. I've seen it through. I've done what I've had to do. I've made my kids proud. I've done whatever I've had to do and I will continue to do that as a father. But as far as me having to prove myself on the table, as far as me having to win another tournament, it doesn't matter anymore. Because you hear people talk and they say this and they say that, and I had to listen to it and I thought, you know what, I'll wipe the floor with you. But you're out there doubting me and you're out there thinking you could beat me. So I had to just do that and go, yeah, that's what I've, you know, done. You know, I'm still the, the, the best player in the world. And that's what I said to him afterwards, I said, don't ever doubt me, don't ever tell me that I'm gone, I will let you know when I'm gone. And now ain't the time, and it ain't for the next three or four years if I wanted it. But maybe I'm going to choose not to, who knows. But I don't have to prove myself anymore. That was a good one. I will say when it's over, is when it's over. But don't, they don't have to doubt me. Because the more they doubt me, the more it just make me want to come back and prove them wrong again. And I don't want to have to go through it again, I've done it. Chapter's over. Tomorrow night at 9, Jeremy Wade is tracking a fish known as the Ball 